So today we have two speakers. Dr. Sylvia Krendel is the USDA APHIS Incident Commander for the African Swine Fever Response in the Dominican Republic. In her role, she is responsible for assisting all aspects of the ASF response, including contributing to the development, development of a regulatory framework, assessing surveillance strategies, implementing biosecurity standards, and movement controls. In her previous role, Dr. Krendel served as the APHIS Area Director for China and Mongolia. Sylvia was also posted at the, F F the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where she worked as the USDA veterinary services expert on risk analysis and epidemiology. Dr. Crendel received her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the Univers University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and her master of public health and epidemiology from the University of Massachusetts. Our second speaker is Dr. Fred Soltera. Dr. Sotera graduated from Kansas State University, where he received a BS in biology and a doctorate in veterinary medicine in 1981. Following graduation, he started working as the veterinarian for the Puerto Rico Zoo in his hometown, hometown of Majigas, Puerto Rico. He started a small animal and exotic practice two years later and worked for 29 years before joining APHIS Veterinary Services. His specialty was avian medicine and orthopedics. He joined BS in Puerto Rico as a field VMO and was interested in foreign animal diseases, which gave him the opportunity to join the EMRS development team and later become part of an incident management team as an EMRS specialist. He is currently the Deputy Incident Commander of the Green Team and has served in numerous deployments that include TB, avian influenza, exotic and virulent Newcastle, vesicular stomatitis, and New World Screwworm. He has been involved in trainings for incident command systems in Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama. He is currently working with international services on HPAI capacity training in the southern cone countries of Chile, Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Bolivia, and is currently actively involved in the ASF protection zone in Puerto Rico. His regular work in veterinary services is the area veterinarian in charge for Puerto Rico since 2012. And with that, I'm going to pass the um, webinar over to Dr. Crindle. Thank you, Liz, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, and greetings uh, from the Dominican Republic. Uh, so I, I will be presenting um, uh, the situation here in the Dominican Republic and uh, our perspective uh, as uh, incident management team uh, uh, after over two years of uh, the first detection of the disease in the DR. Oh. I think I have. Okay, so uh, the, as we all know, the disease was uh, reported in the uh, DR in uh, July 2021, and uh, ever since the introduction has a uh, disruption in the swine industry in the DR, we have to remember that the DR, uh, the staple food is uh, swine and swine products. Uh, so, but before that, the disease was uh, introduced in the DR um, in 1978, and it was not until uh, 1979 when uh, the, the country uh, decided a complete uh, depopulation of uh, swine. And uh, once they started the depopulation, uh, the uh, country was uh, free of the disease uh, two years after in uh, 1981. This took a huge effort. Uh, I, I believe around 90 uh, groups of uh, called brigades uh, with uh, around 10, uh, between five and 10 veterinarians, uh, people doing compensation, et cetera. And, uh, and until then uh, the disease was finally eradicated. So it was a huge effort. Uh, so it, that that was uh, under consideration uh, when the disease first appeared uh, in the Dominican Republic in 2021. But uh, the situation is uh, completely different these days. And uh, they have not have any uh, agreement. Some of the producers um, will consider that the best way 
we would have been like the population while others uh, completely think the, the opposite. Also, it is important to, to really uh, uh, think about uh, the large amount of small producers that are in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and I will show the statistics uh, over 13,000 that will uh, that have like less than uh, uh, over 13,000 uh, uh, 13, producers with less than uh, 25 pigs. Uh, and the, the population of these pigs will create a, a big political uh, conflict. Uh, so, uh, wouldn't be possible. And, and I think we also have to consider that the situation in 1979 was uh, different in the sense of uh, globalization. Uh, right now, uh, the disease is also uh, in Haiti, has been detected in Haiti shortly after uh, uh, it was detected in the Dominican Republic. And the border between Haiti will always remain, uh, Haiti and the DR will always remain a, a big challenge to address. So, so with all these things in mind, uh, even if they would have considered the population, the likelihood of uh, other re reintroduction because um, of challenges that are in the Dominican Republic that they will be uh, discussing would be really diff difficult to uh, consider the disease uh, eradicated at this point. So, uh, so what I will be discussing is what we intended to do, why we are here, you know, and I will just make that clear because uh, the Dominican Republic is very near uh, the United States and is very near, uh, uh, you know, particularly Puerto Rico. And there are a lot of Dominicans that uh, will come back and forth. There are, there are approximately 600,000 Dominicans that will have a double nationality, US and DR, and they come back and forth and they like uh, taking with them uh, a products typical of the Dominican Republic, and these products include uh, pork and pork products. So uh, that's why we are here. We have to really stop uh, any escape of the disease. And also uh, what we intended to do at one point was eradicating uh, the disease. Uh, so I will be also discussing the current situation, uh, what we have achieved in this uh, last uh, in the two years that we have been here and the challenges that remain. So uh, one of the things, you know, uh, was when we came here, what is the swine population? Uh, because uh, the latest census was, uh, was done very uh, long time before, approximately 10 years before uh, the disease was detected. So uh, we needed to have the, the, um, the real account of the pigs. So uh, it is considered that the amount of pigs uh, before the disease appeared was approximately 2 million pigs, which are around 364 commercial farms and a, a 60,000 sows. Uh, a census was conducted uh, a, at the end of 2022, and a, the, the number of pigs really decreased to have, uh, as well as the number of commercial farms, uh, the sows, and again, you know, the biggest challenge that is uh, the number of backyard uh, uh, farms in the uh, DR that have less than 25 uh, pigs, and this account for 13,000. So uh, here we can see the distribution of the swine population, most of the uh, production system is in the central part of the country, central north part of the country, uh, where we have like the commercial farms, that area is, uh, there are like cities like Santiago and Vega, which are very important swine producer, uh, producing areas. And, um, and the rest of the country, we have like these uh, small producers. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and Important also to re, uh, uh, to say that you know the investment of uh, 
the uh, large farms it has been considered around uh, 500 uh, half, half a billion dollars the investment that they had and uh, they they give jobs to um 58,000 people and um, and the the these uh, the little pig farms, you know, which remain as a big problem because of the um, very low uh, biosecurity, uh, are considered by them like a pig piggy farms, and uh, is also the challenging uh, uh, issue that uh, they will process uh, their pigs in their small little farms and they will send uh, sell the products outside. Uh, so, and with this lack of uh, biosecurity contributing to uh, uh, the recycle of the virus uh, in the country. So, so this is a study that we did in, uh, with the University of Minnesota. Uh, and uh, what we did here is um, we, we have a, a system uh, by which we compensate producers affected by African swine fever. And uh, this is through one of uh, our collaborators. And um, uh, we send verifiers uh, to check on uh, the, the number of animals that have been affected to, to be able to uh, provide the compensation to these farmers. So, so we uh, were able to map all these, all these cases uh, between November 2022 and June uh, 2023. And we can see how spread the disease is uh, in the country. Uh, and the disease is uh, basically uh, showing, a, a, was showing before a path pattern of uh, an epidemic disease that has really become endemic uh, with less number of uh, uh, susceptible animals showing disease. We see the presence of clusters. Uh, when these cases are reported, we take uh, information on uh, the type of biosecurity um, at the farm level. You know, all these cases really uh, have uh, very little or non uh, biosecurity. The responses to the outbreak is not really a full response. Um, sometimes they will uh, do the perifocal areas while some other times they will not do uh, perifocal areas. So it's, it's a very difficult to uh, have a full uh, response of the disease. But, um, but basically, this this uh, this map is showing uh, the endemicity. Uh, so so um, since uh, May 2022, also samples of positive animals are uh, sent to NBSL, and these samples are uh, a, a sequence and. Um, we can see also the presence of uh, these uh, different clusters of the disease. Uh, MBSL uh, has reported um, uh, mainly uh, two different uh, groups of African swine fever virus, uh, uh, the group one and group two. And the group one is mainly the one that we are predominantly seeing uh, in, in the country. And as for the uh, African swine fever uh, genotype is uh, the genotype two, uh, Georgia uh, uh, 2007, uh, one Hispaniola group one. Uh, so uh, it, uh, until December, that is the last report, and BSL has uh, completed the uh, genoma sequences of uh, 400 and uh, 49 positive samples uh, that have been sent from here. So we uh, uh, have a very good understanding of uh, what is happening. And what we see uh, uh, down is uh, the cluster detected that, that of course, uh, really uh, could be associated with the, the clusters that we see uh, have seen in, the, uh, uh, in one of the slides showing uh, the outbreaks that uh, we have compensated. 
So uh, what we are, uh, what do we have to do at the farm or what do we care at the farm level uh, to avoid the risk of African swine fever? So, and, or what are the risk pathways by which uh, African swine fever could be introduced in an area? So introduction of infected pigs. Uh, so, uh, and I will show you all these different factors and I will show you, I will discuss how these are affected by the regulations. For, a, for instance, here, a, um, there are regulations that a, a wouldn't allow the movement of a, animals for repopulation. A, and these a, regulations uh, have been in place uh, since, I would say, middle of 2022. Uh, so, so, but you know, still, so only pigs eh, eh, are able to be sent from uh, the farm uh, to to slaughter, and to be able to do that, they have to eh, show eh, the presence of uh, movement documents allowing eh, this. Uh, allowing these pigs to, to go from one place to another. However, so that is possible to do, but only if the pigs uh, comply with, or the farmer will comply with a, 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 some active surveillance that is conducted at the farm, requiring that the farmer will submit samples from the farm every 21 days, and they are negative uh, for African swine fever. So all the regulation, it seemed to be good in the sense that you can control the movement of infected pigs. However, uh, movements uh, still occur. And, uh, and these, these movements, um, including uh, the repopulation of farms that couldn't be repopulated, still take place, uh, allowing still for for uh, the, the recycle of the virus and uh, and also uh, the continued spread of the disease. So we have feed as a possible source of infection, you know, of course, contaminated feed. And there are regulations here uh, by, uh, by which uh, the, uh, it is prohibited to use uh, soil feeding uh, for the feeding of pigs. However, you know, the soil feeding uh, still occurs and there, is, uh, there are no enforcement of the regulations. So also we see people, veterinarians, farm, farm workers, et cetera, or trucks, um, most of the that that could introduce the disease because of a lack of protective gear that is also happening here and a large equipment. Uh, one thing that we don't have in the Dominican Republic uh, is uh, the wild board, so uh, that wouldn't be a source of infection. Uh, but I, I wanted to to show this because uh, from this we can see that you know, we are not able to address all these uh, different sources of infection. Uh, these tracks, for instance, um, uh, uh, with the sequencing, we have had discussions with the uh, veterinary authority and uh, the lack of biosecurity uh, for the, the tracks or uh, the movement of the pigs has uh, really contributed to uh, the spread of the disease here. So infected semen as well. You know, we can see uh, how they they keep uh, moving the boards from uh, one place to another, contributing to the spread of infection. Uh, so, but you know, we are interested in uh, how to stop the disease from escaping the DR. So, how the disease can escape the DR? Uh, informal trade, um, and and these are a small amount of products that will leave the DR. You know, I mentioned all the uh, Dominicans with uh, uh, double nationalities that we try to. Uh, to understand the profile and to understand how we can uh, stop the movement of these products. Uh, we can also see that another way will be humans, uh, veterinarians, farm, farm workers, 
etcétera, and international garbage. International garbage has been uh, for for the longest time associated this uh, 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 been associated with the uh, presence of or movement of the disease and formal trade that will be the less likely way. Uh, and uh, uh, as regards to uh, formal trade with um, with the U.S., we don't really allow any formal trade of pork and pork products, but could be other products that could be uh, associated with the, the spread of African swine fever. I think, you know, still will be the less likely pathway. So uh, once the disease uh, appeared in the Dominican Republic, uh, the Dominican Republic government requested a uh, cooperation required uh, from the U.S. to uh, be able to uh, eradicate the disease at that point, and it was a memorandum of understanding that uh, between AFIS and the Dominican Republic addressing roles and responsibilities uh, in what was uh, considered uh, the eradication at one point, and uh, and also uh, requested uh, in this uh, memorandum of understanding discuss the presence of uh, a, an incident command, unified incident command that will be a AFIS a incident command and a, the Dominican Republic incident command working together to a, address uh, the disease. The Dominican Republic also requested a help on, on many issues. One of them was uh, compensation of producers affected by ASF. And, uh, and uh, we, one of the, our cooperations uh, is with the AICA, uh, and we set up a compensation and a, a and the compensation until then was done by Banco Agricola, that is the main agricultural bank in the Dominican Republic, and they ran out of funds, so, so we took over. So we worked with them on the compensation, and through this uh, cooperative agreement, we have, um, we have uh, verifiers that will go to the farms and uh, will uh, take information uh, from us to uh, be able to compensate the right amount of animals uh, with the right categorization of these animals. Also, this compensation uh, will be, um, it, you know, it was considered the compensation as a way to encourage the producers to report the disease. So the compensation is, uh, uh, the amount that we compensate is very similar to uh, the market value of the pigs. Uh, so, uh, so we consider more beneficial to compensate the producers uh, since we consider that these animals couldn't be sent to slaughter directly uh, because they have to comply with all these other uh, regulatory framework that they have in place in the DR. However, you know, the compensation didn't really uh, provide that because uh, farmers were still be able to send animals to slaughter. Uh, so, so one thing that we uh, put in this compensation scheme is that the animals, uh, for, for, for the farmer to be compensated, they have to comply with the uh, Dominican Republic uh, regulations for uh, regulations. They have to be part of the active surveillance. Uh, and uh, the government has to conduct to cleaning and disinfections of the farm within at least seven or 10 day period. Um, so um, so we, we try to, to make it, uh, to, to get some assurance that even if we are compensating, we uh, could be uh, decreasing the amount of uh, circulating virus. Uh, so we have also some other agreements with other uh, collaborators. One is OIRSA. I didn't mention the AIC agreement was up to uh, $50 million. The second agreement I will mention is OIRSA, 
uh, that mainly deals with Central American countries. And this is a $9 million uh, agreement. And uh, there are different work plan. One is a diagnostic support, and this included um, uh, doing upgrades in the uh, National uh, Veterinary Laboratory in the Dominican Republic uh, called LAVESEN. Some uh, uh, of these included improving the infrastructure of the lab uh, um, and uh, the presence of a, a molecular biology unit. Uh, so also a network uh, for uh, for the laboratory. Uh, so another work plan uh, deals with a uh, operational uh, field support, and uh, this uh, include um, uh, hiring uh, veterinarians under our work work plan that could go to to the field and conduct the field investigations because uh, the uh, the veterinary services here didn't have that capacity. And uh, the third work plan is uh, biocontention and biosecurity. The, the uh, biocontention is mainly stopping the disease from leaving the country. And, uh, and biosecurity is mainly related to the processing of um, the processing of international garbage. The biocontention uh, in this case uh, is mainly focused in the presence of canine units that are uh, the main uh, airports uh, that are trained uh, specially to uh, detect uh, port, uh, pork and pork products uh, in passengers uh, that are leaving the Dominican Republic mainly focusing on uh, US flights, uh, but also other flights leaving the Dominican Republic. Uh, so we have a other a work plan, a one with a FAS, a foreign agricultural services. And a, we have a, a campaign, uh, is the PICS uh, Don't Fly campaign that you know has been uh, in all social media and uh, trying to uh, uh, attract the attention of the Dominicans uh, having this uh, music that is very popular here, bachata and a uh, pigs dancing the bachata and uh, showing what pigs cannot, get that pigs cannot be leaving the Dominican Republic. Uh, so we also have a cooperative agreement or an agreement with USAID for $2 million. Uh, and uh, this agreement is, is supporting different livelihoods for swine producers that have been affected uh, by ASF. And, um, and we have um, uh, around 150 farms that have been affected either because they were cases or they were in the perifocal areas, uh, had changed the production system from a pigs to uh, sheep and goats. Uh, so they were 150 and I think we have now around uh, 130 farms. Uh, and this USA the agreement including included communication uh, uh, campaign and regional awareness. So uh, we see here some of the changes uh, at, the, at the lab, at the lab SN, uh, a diagnostic infrastructure. Uh, also, uh, we provided uh, two uh, technicians that are uh, working at the lab. Uh, regarding the lab, also uh, NVSL sends uh, to the Dominican Republic um, uh, technicians to work at the lab, and they have been doing that since uh, over two and a half years ago, uh, even before the disease was diagnosed, and, uh, and um, have provided a, a lot of uh, other type of support and equipment. So, uh, so I mentioned the canine unit. We have uh, 28 canine units in, in, in four uh, main airports. Uh, so 
and we are expecting to have 35 uh, units. Uh, we also have to, you know, the units is the canine and the handler of the canine. Uh, we also have to provide the vehicles to uh, transport the dogs. We also have provided uh, um, uh, resources and have um, uh, encouraged them to have a canine school, and they have um, they have uh, invested also on this canine school that is the first canine school for in the DR for the detection of agricultural products with particular emphasis on a uh, pork and pork products. Uh, these uh, canine units, uh, we, we also, uh, every time the canines uh, will detect something, we take the profile of the people who are taking, we say, smuggling the products, uh, so try to know what educational campaign we should uh, be addressing to, to discourage uh, this from happening. Uh, so we take all that information and we wait also uh, how much uh, product uh, is taking uh, or they, they were planning to, or they, they, the dogs are uh, catching. Uh, so few, some months we get around uh, 1,000 kilos of products that are confiscated. And these are mainly uh, pork products like uh, salami and some other denominations that are typical uh, products from the DR. Uh, so all these products are confiscated. And for that to happen, because the products are products that are allowed in the Dominican Republic, they are not prohibited, we need to have a, a resolution um, that will allow this confiscation. So, uh, so anything that has pork cannot leave the Dominican Republic. So uh, I mentioned the incinerators. We bought uh, six incinerators that can process around 200 uh, kilos of uh, products per hour. And uh, these incinerators are mainly for international uh, garbage. Uh, we also bought incinerators that are being placed uh, in the border areas of the Dominican Republic that will handle a uh, uh, a smaller amounts of products. And I mentioned the, uh, the compensation uh, that is done through this uh, verification unit through uh, the AICA uh, work plan uh, in collaboration with the Banco Agricola. So uh, by um, November uh, 2022, uh, we realized that uh, it was going to be very difficult to, to eradicate the disease in the DR. So we tried to, to focus in different areas uh, um, to be able to, to measure the advances that we have uh, in the control of the disease uh, or stopping the, the spread of the disease. So one of these areas is biosecurity and biocontention and mentioned our uh, uh, OIRSA work plan. And, and this is what this does is like, we try to isolate the Dominican Republic uh, by the dogs and uh, dog units. And uh, we also have the incinerators that will stop any other introduction of the uh, disease by the treatment of the international garbage. So uh, reduce uh, one other focus is reduce the incidence of the disease uh, nationwide. Uh, so and try to promote the early detection. Uh, we are very lucky that uh, the lab is is really a, a great accomplishment, you know. And we thank MBSL and Suli and all the technical people that came to the DR because uh, what we do have is a, a good laboratory here that can do an early detection. However, you know, uh, a lab on its own cannot do uh, really that much. Uh, so, um, you know. We we cannot uh, have many times this uh, rapid elimination of the of the disease. 
we uh, the the third line of work uh, was uh, related to eradicating the disease or controlling the disease in one or two specific areas of the countries. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it was considered the eastern part of the country. That's where uh, Punta Cana and all these uh, big uh, hotels and tourist attractions are. And, they, and that area has uh, mainly uh, small producers and trying to have a full response, uh, ASF response in that area and a control of the disease. Um, however, it was uh, some disagreement with the producers and uh, we, we couldn't really do that area because that's not the area where the big producers are, which is, as I mentioned, the north uh, central part of the country. So um, there were other proposals, but uh, uh, it was never really a definition of what area it uh, was the targeted area for a full response uh, uh, of African swine fever. So, um, so regarding uh, surveillance, um, uh, uh, the main uh, the, the main type of uh, well, right now we are having a active surveillance since probably around three months ago and. Uh, uh, trying to focus this active surveillance in uh, small uh, producers, but mainly uh, the cases that we have are due to a uh, passive surveillance. Uh, so uh, the digitalization of information, we um, um, we try to work with the Dominican Republic in a system to uh, digitalize the information in a system that they develop called uh, uh, CD Agro uh, that has uh, many problems, uh, but less problems than they, uh, than they had at the beginning. But all the information, at least when there are cases, is included in into uh, this uh, digital uh, system. Uh, so, uh, and I wanted to mention uh, that uh, we are also working on a, this active surveillance, doing this MTM uh, sample pooling and try to, to get more uh, samples tested. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we thank, you know, Puerto Rico for providing, uh, and Fred for providing uh, training that will be implemented soon. And we are trying to implement also uh, for active surveillance and repopulation that is the legal repopulation that is going to be allowed uh, in the next months or so. We are going to use uh, the oral uh, fluid technique. Uh, so there are not really movement controls that uh, that work correctly in the uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, we are trying to um, to get some uh, di digital system for uh, movement controls, and we are uh, working in that process. So without uh, movement controls and without penalties or accountability, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to be able to have a very target response. So, uh, and we have, you know, uh, uh, some biosecurity issues uh, as uh, was demonstrated in the in one of the slides that I show you um, on um, the cases uh, that are being reported. But there are uh, biosecurity issues throughout the whole production, uh, pig production chain. Uh, slaughterhouses are a consider a big problem, uh, uh, feed meals, transportation, and uh, the fact that, you know, uh, there is still soil feeding and uh, no uh, regulation or not regulatory program trying to uh, reduce the spread of the disease that way. So uh, you have here uh, the dogs. Uh, it's a picture of our one of the new incinerators that is going to uh, start working in 
this month in a, in one of the um, uh, airports. Um, when I first came to the DR, I didn't really know what uh, it was uh, required for all of this to work. You know, just buying at the incinerator was not really enough. You need to know also uh, how sustainable it will be for them to have an incinerator because uh, it cost around hundred thousand dollars per year to be able to. Um, to maintain the incinerator. Also the incinerator uh, needs a housing area uh, that we didn't really contemplate that. So it has been a learning experience for me. Uh, so, um, and I mentioned also everything else, um, you know, about the canine school and um, the dog. So if you come to the DR, you will see uh, our dogs um, that, that are that will have the USDA and OIRSA uh, logo. So this is uh, along with this um, uh, commercial that we have on a pig stone fly. We had a lot of big bo uh, uh, billboards. Uh, uh, no cargues con eso. Don't take this. And that the dogs don't. They, that the pigs don't fly. Uh, so these were all throughout the city. We also uh, have these um, in the cars that will, uh, as advertisement in the cars that uh, will move the dogs and also the trucks uh, that we use for, um, for the veterinarians to go to the field. Uh, one thing I noticed in the Dominican Republic is that uh, people are in traffic all day long. So having a, something in the car that is in front of you helps you pay attention and you will remember what you, you have seen. Uh, so, so, okay, so these are many things that, uh, that we should always consider uh, when we address a disease like African swine fever and maybe many other diseases. Uh, so, so the presence of a, a biosecurity um, and I think I have another slide on how we are um, addressing biosecurity here. The presence of protocols, a diagnostic and monitoring program, uh, adequate production system, you know, is something that, you know, when we go to the farms, we notice that there are many issues uh, there as well. Uh, the presence of a database, you know, when we came, the, it was no database uh, accounting for for the cases or, or the suspect cases of the disease, uh, animal movement controls that we are in the process of having, hopefully will be when they implemented. Uh, we need to train a lot of people and it should be accountability for all these actions. Um, I think I missed the biosecurity slide, but um, but uh, we do have a cooperative agreement with FAO uh, or an agreement with FAO uh, for biosecurity. And uh, this is biosecurity throughout the, the uh, swine production chain and, um, and trying to improve uh, biosecurity uh, at all levels. Uh, so, um, and it, it, we notice a lot of farms that are becoming interested in stopping the disease and uh, uh, addressing these biosecurity issues. So, okay, so here we have our achievements. Uh, there were many challenges, but we have achievements. Uh, so understanding of the disease and dynamics is first, we are able to send samples to NBSL and the sequences of, a sequencing of the virus is uh, done periodically, uh, what helps us understand the dynamics of the disease in the country. Uh, we started implementing a active a surveillance, uh, uh, a, and this is done with our resources, right? Uh, a 15 teams. Um, and we have like a better view of uh, what is happening in the country. So through active surveillance, 
I would say like every week, you know, we, we get the passive surveillance cases. Maybe we get like six cases per week and maybe two are due, due to active uh, surveillance. Right now, uh, active surveillance is really focusing on, um, on small uh, producers. Uh, the training of pooling samples that I have already mentioned, uh, the compensation, which is an achievement because we were able to, to um, uh, include different uh, requirements uh, uh, on the compensation that really uh, would allow to uh, limit the spread of the disease in the country. Uh, and uh, increase uh, the number of samples that can be processed at LabSN, the national lab, that is, uh, I think they can process around uh, a, a thousand samples a, a day. Uh, and we'll be, um, we hope, you know, this will be lower because we are going to be implementing the, the MDM pooling samples and also uh, the uh, oral fluids. Uh, so regarding the biosecurity and biocontainment, uh, uh, we have uh, purchased the incinerators uh, for um, for five for five airports. One of the airports will have two. That is the most important uh, airport here that receives most of the flights. Uh, we have an educational campaign. Now we are considering a new educational campaign addressing, a, again, the particular profile of the people uh, trying to smuggle pork and pork products. We are using cartoons this time uh, following the uh, pigs don't fly uh, issues and, um, or the, our first campaign. And uh, this is going to uh, be in the in a free newspaper, so everybody will have access. Um, so uh, hopefully, we will have that soon. We have the uh, FAO agreement uh, that I mentioned, and there are four hundred and fifty-one farms registered. You know, people are very interested in this uh, biosecurity. We have the canine unit. Um, we have developed uh, the standards also for the Dominican Republic for the treatment of international garbage. And I mentioned the USAID program, uh, changing the livelihood of the swine producers into uh, sheep and goats. Uh, so um, these are uh, some of the uh, resolutions uh, or regu regulatory framework in uh, the DR. And uh, just to show you this, because we try to incorporate uh, their uh, regulations into whatever we do here. So we are within uh, the regulatory framework of uh, the DR and the veterinary services. Uh, so, uh, so there are uh, challenges. Uh, uh, one of the main challenges is the enforcement of uh, the regulation, or even remind them, reminding them about their legal framework. Uh, so, the competency of the, the some of the uh, veterinarians. Uh, and the lack of financial uh, resources and the sustainability of uh, many of these things um, when we leave the DR. So, uh, so uh, we talk about the presence of a unified incident uh, command uh, system uh, that includes the DR and uh, AFIS. Uh, the DR portion has never been really a fully a operational. Uh, so th 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 there are a, also other challenges like a cleaning and disinfection or, or biosecurity at all these levels of the production chain. Um, and the big challenge that will remain in the Dominican Republic that is uh, the border with Haiti and how to address uh, 
uh, Haiti uh, in the context of um, stopping the, if the disease is controlled, stopping the disease from being uh, reintroduced uh, from uh, Haiti. Uh, so um, you probably uh, have seen uh, or read that it was a small uh, ASF a vaccine a pilot that it took place in the Dominican Republic um, at the beginning of last year, probably April or May last year. Um, and uh, it was a small pilot and uh, there were some issues uh, with this uh, pilot that included the, the number of some uh, animals that were part of the pilot uh, controls and uh, vaccinated animals. Uh, so as a, a, they, they gathered all this information, the vaccine that a, it was used was a, the a vaccine from Vietnam, Navetco, a, that is an ARS a vaccine. Uh, so uh, around maybe uh, October, September, October last year, uh, the agriculture minister invited ARS, a Manuel a Borca, uh, to uh, discuss the results of this uh, vaccine trial that took place in the DR and uh, to ask for recommendations if uh, the Navetco vaccine uh, was a good vaccine to be used uh, in the uh, Dominican Republic. So uh, basically, um, as a result of these uh, conversations, uh, with uh, ARS, um, in, in the vaccine based on the results um, gathered, the vaccine was uh, safe and effective, but the numbers that uh, they used were not uh, statistically sufficient to recommend the wide, widespread use of a vaccine. So, uh, ARS recommended uh, having a large scale safety uh, study and, um, and ARS uh, um, asked AFIS to, um, to, to collaborate in uh, this um, uh, evaluating the possibility of conducting uh, this large scale uh, study in the Dominican Republic. So uh, what this study will be, will be like a kind of a, a modified cohort or case control study where you vaccinate some animals and you have some animals that are controlled and you uh, look for the presence of uh, a severe events or adverse events or mild events. Uh, so, uh, so uh, they uh, it, it, what they are trying to have is uh, with this new studies uh, more consistency in uh, in all the decisions and a very um, uh, a, a trial where all these different uh, variables that will be part of the the study are, will be absolutely under a our uh, control so we know what is happening in uh, the first uh, a vaccine trial that was conducted in the DR was uh, not uh, transparent and the vaccine was not brought uh, um, uh, the right way in, into the DR in the right manner so so and the producers were not really informed so we are trying to to change all these uh, perceptions um, and we are evaluating uh, the possibility of conducting uh, this uh, new trial in the DR. So, um, so we there are all these issues that we don't know. Uh, when will this study occur? Uh, so will be ARS and AFIS uh, um, it, conducting the study and you know how we are going to be implementing uh, the study here, uh, decisions around the number of animals and the farms and uh, 
uh, the definitions on what should be uh, monitored. And uh, I think this is the end of my presentation. Uh, we had a larger team before, but uh, we are uh, just four people here. And this is the uh, incident management team. And I am grateful to them for uh, all the work that we do here. That is not easy, but you know we are still here and uh, trying to do our best. So thank you, everybody. That ends my presentation. Go ahead and have, uh, you can stop sharing your screen. Fred can share his screen. We'll do this presentation and then we will address all the questions at the end. Liz, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. You want to go up to display settings so that it's um, not on. I can see your notes. Or you can just okay. put it on um, a presentation mode. I am trying to. High presenter view. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then I need to see my notes. Uh, wait. I don't see you sharing your screen, though, Fred. No, I'm going to go back again. Yeah. There you go. Okay, let me get my notes. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Liz, and the training staff for inviting me to give an update of the status of the ASF uh, protection zone in Puerto Rico. It is important to keep the discussion going about the risk of ASF entering the US industry. And this presentation will focus on the risks and the response efforts uh, during the detection of ASF in Hispaniola with a focus on the protection zone activities in Puerto Rico. I'll try to do it uh, as an update because most of you have seen uh, a lot of the slides. Uh, before we get started, let's look at what we're talking about. Uh, this is the island of Puerto Rico, made of, of a few islands, uh, and we're located about 71 miles uh, east or, or west uh, of, of the DR, and the Virgin Islands are um, east of Puerto Rico. Um, there is, however, a little island of Mona, which is a wildlife refuge that is full with feral swine. No domestic swine, but it is a very high risk event there. So DR, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. So um, the USDA did submit that dossier, that document in 2021, uh, a few months right after the confirmation of July 28, 2021. Um, this created an impact in the movement of swine products between PR and the mainland that uh, involved PPQ and the need to respond with an increase in personnel and outreach to really mitigate the amount of seized products in the airports and shipping services. Because the amount of products that, that were going from Puerto Rico to basically all the Eastern coast was huge. So that, uh, that created uh, a really large uh, uh, well, work that had to be done in a very short amount of time. So we had to respond very aggressively to this risk pathway, uh, developing diagnostic sampling and developing, developing new surveillance streams to make sure that we could assure OIE, which is now WOA, that uh, we were going to be doing what the protection zone document uh, was saying. Um, and really Virgin Islands is part of that protection zone um, as of Puerto Rico, so we're treated at the same uh, uh, regulations. So that protection zone has mitigations that we have to do, uh, uh, clearly outlined in the goals that we have to show our trading partners. It's very important that we uh, compile and complete these uh, goals, because if we don't, uh, partners that are coming to uh, um, audit these uh, protection zone uh, documents 
will will be, have second thoughts about approving it. So mitigation measures, the training, uh, it's very important for the producers, the veterinarians and the public, that active surveillance of ASS, which you will see how much we have to increase it, that enhanced surveillance in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, the laboratory capacity that we had to build to make sure that we can do the testing and trying to um, reduce the potential pathways of introductions of ASF. Um, the movement of these animal products and especially if you know pasteles, large, sauce, large sausages and other items had to be confiscated at airports. And then the few first, the, couple, the first couple of months, the amount of product was incredible. Um, at first Christmas was very sad for a lot of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in the States because they could not enjoy the whole food and the parties, but it had to be done. So the concern of the, of the stakeholders is how long are these mitigation safeguards will be in place in Puerto Rico and the USVI. So this is one of the decisions that had to be addressed and we are now then going to the third year. Um, so how long can we sustain this effort? Okay, so we've had several audits from different countries, a strong state partners. Um, the, the trade staff has been really very proactive in, in, in guiding these. And I think we have done a very good job of reporting, uh, but every country has the ability to come in and audit and either accept or not accept the protection zones because it is a really new uh, tool that uh, we may not know if it's gonna be accepted or not in all countries. Okay, so as you can see, this wheel has all the very important activities that we have to do. And these different activities work simultaneously. All of them depend one uh, on each other. Um, as you see, we have the illegal boat landing program, which has been unique for Puerto Rico. Now Florida has a, a similar programs called the migrant boat landing program. Uh, based on the same uh, theory that we need to address this illegal movement of products coming in. Our active surveillance of all the premises, our passive surveillances of all the foreign animal disease investigations, our slaughter surveillance, which was not in place when, uh, when ASF started in the DR. And, and since then we have uh, done a very good job of establishing it. Uh, Wildlife Services has taken care of the Feral Swine Active Surveillance Program the Custom Border uh, Protection uh, Agency is in charge of all the surveillance in the ferry and the ports. And PPQ is doing all the work in airports, um, the, the mail, the FedEx, the UPS, all the packages. And this is really hard work to do. Um, we have to do it every day. So the enhanced surveillance project has been going on since August 1st, um, increasing all the surveillances in Puerto Rico, um, increasing the, uh, the illegal boat landing team, um, getting more terms to work on this, inspection of all the vessels, inspection of all the three kilometers garbage feeding in those areas, and you see that. Establishing, which was not operational, the NVSL satellite lab in Dorado, which I'm very proud of, um, and that was done in three months, believe it or not. We have coordinating with FIS uh, a very good relationship, which we, we didn't have before this started. So FSIS is on board with us. And then the, the outreach and educational activities that we're doing now. Keep going on this. So as you can see, uh, when we started before the confirmation, this was our goals on the Swine Health Protection Act. And these, these what the numbers of samples we were doing active surveillance. As soon as we were confirmed in 2021, look at the jump that we had to do um, to 4,219 samples, and then in 2022 to 6,865. So imagine how much resources and how much uh, logistics we had to do to really show these numbers um, and all these samples going through EMERS and making sure they're all negative. So this is a very active, very, intense situation 
how long can we sustain it as long as we need to, but it all depends on the status of the DR. If we get the DR to improve the situation of, of their uh, status, or if they will be declared endemic, that will make the protection zone a much larger, larger event and, and longer event. So those are the things we are being considered and really worried about. The Dorado Lab is the success story of, of the ASF detection. Um, we were able to set it up and run it and bring resources from uh, NVSL to make sure they could uh, establish all the testing needed. And right now we're doing everything that is being done in, in NVSL and FADO, it's being done in Dorado, including, including tissues. Um, we have just started oral fluids from foreign animal disease investigations. So that's another uh, sampling stream that we wanna develop and we wanna talk about it. So. This is our very uh, Dorado Lab um, success story. We are going to invest, and, and I'm very proud that uh, Dr. Robin Holland will be here next month um, to start out the renovation of, of the lab. And uh, I think that they will be investing uh, a few million dollars on this uh, Dorado Lab to get it to a better, even uh, efficient situation. And we're very happy that this is happening. Um, like you know, um, we're a territory of, this, of the United States covered by all the, the CFR regulations without having that Congress representation. Um, the USDA through the Swine Health Protection Act implements all the rules on the garbage feeding licenses, which is the main thing different that the DR does not have. It might, be an, it might be illegal to feed garbage in the DR, but it is not regulated. We have been regulating the garbage feeding in Puerto Rico um, way, way, way back before 2000, even before I started. Um, and that to me has helped uh, really stop C uh, the classical swine fever from coming to the island. But ASF is a different monster. So I think the the Swine Health Protection Act through the garbage feeding license program has set up tremendously. Now, the problem is the, the Puerto Rico Department of Agriculture has the enforcement authority on these licenses. So we can do all the work we are doing um, to maintain these garbage licenses, but once they get to regulations and enforcement, we don't have the authority. And that has to be discussed to see where we can improve. And like it says here, we are covered under the same federal protection zone, but uh, managing of, of the USVI in Puerto Rico is different. This is what we have to work on. We have 12 animal health technicians to cover all the island. Um, some states don't have that much, but Puerto Rico, because of the topography and the traffic, um, it is not easy to move from one place to another. So in order for us to complete that, uh, enhanced surveillance, we have to have at least 12 animal health technicians working full time on the garbage feeding and the sampling. We have three VMOs that supervise all these 12 AHTs. They're divided into West, Central, and Eastern areas, and they're constantly working on the garbage feeding and other programs, but mainly garbage feeding. So the backyard producers in Puerto Rico represent the very high risk of introduction of ASF and CSF. Um, because of the low levels of biosecurity in these premises and the very poor control of movement of the animals, it's very open to any kind of introduction on the backyard feeding. So to keep these garbage feeders inspected every three months and trying to get them into compliance mode is very, very difficult and it's our challenge every day. Now, the problem is it takes only one to, to get infected, to spread it around. So we, we are always constantly being uh, challenged to keep these uh, swine garbage feeders under the best biosecurity possible, um, at least the minimum biosecurity possible, but it's very hard. 
We have about 20 concentrate uh, producers that are the better biosecurity ones um, that we checked through slaughter. So we don't get into their farms every two to three months. And then pre-license requests that are in progress about five a month. Um, that's the current scope. You can see in this map, all the active, uh, it's all over the island. It's all over Vieques Island. Um, that's why we had to be working around. There's really not an area more concentrated than the others. Like you see, most of this is garbage feeding, non-garbage 30%. The problem with Puerto Rico is the cost of, co of commercial feed is so high because we have to import it. We cannot produce it. That, that, it's, that is why garbage feeding has to be still worked out. Um, we have to depend on the illegal boat landing surveillance, and this is a very good sample of the work they do. This started in early 2000 uh, when CSF was present in the DR. The mission has been to remove all the meat-based products that arrive in the vessels when we can find them. But every time we find one vessel, two or three of them come in on, um, so we, we cannot hit 100%. That's always our goal. We, we do whatever we can, but there's always one or two that come in that we cannot find. So we have to identify all of them, visit them every three, seven days, do an inventory, put tax on all the animals, and then recheck and bleed at 21 days with ASF, CSF, PCR, and ELISA. Any sick animals between that time will be converted to an FADI, and the VMO will be there uh, as soon as possible. This is all the events and all the landings that you can see, it's all over the island. And they keep constantly coming back and it all depends on the weather and, and what's going on on the island, on, on the DR. If, if, if politics allow it, they will be coming in three or four out a day, but that is, that's a work that we have to be ready for them because we, we can't predict what they do. Um, this is a very good uh, data uh that we have until the 2024 as you can see since the start of the protection zone almost 3000 pounds of sausage um, um pork products lard anything that they can bring in and remember they're bringing these products not to distribute in puerto rico they have to bring them to for the trip for the food but all of them are considered infected. So we have to try to prevent them from going into our supplies, into our, into our uh, local industry. And uh, it's a day by day by day uh, uh, process, very hard to do. So um, what we have to do now is increase our outreach to these producers. We need to keep going to the feed stores, the inspections, we are very happy now that we have uh, um, a project with Ohio State that is supporting a biosecurity standards for the swine industry. It's a two year farm bill project. They already came to Puerto Rico and did one of the uh, trainings all over the island. They're going to do it again uh, during this semester and they're going to concentrate more on biosecurity. So at least we're getting a help uh, because really, um, our staff does what it can on the outreach, but we need help from industry and other stakeholders to do that. Um, these inspection tasks are, are taken out of EMERS, as you can see. Uh, this is our main reason to be in Puerto Rico, it's the swine work. And you can see our searches, our inspections, our pre licensing the illegal boat landing, everything is tracked in EMERS. Uh, without EMERS, we couldn't work. So um, what I am um, recommending to all the other Southern states is get your act together and put every premise that you can that are swine related in EMERS before you have to do any kind of work. This is very critical. If you don't have this before the event, you're never gonna catch up. So this is our collaboration team. Um, as you can see, we have different agencies finally working together. It took a long time, CBP, PPQ, the Wildlife Services, the Coast Guard, the uh, Puerto Rico Rapid uh, Actions, um, the Department of Natural Resources. If you don't get all these agencies to work with you, you can't do it alone. 
it's not gonna happen. And uh, we can do all the surveillance, but that is not gonna take care of an event that if we get it in Puerto Rico. So wildlife services, it is concentrating on the feral swine con uh, program. They have done an amazing job. They started before well, ASF started in the DR because we had a severe feral pig out outbreak event after Hurricane Maria. I don't know if you've seen pictures of it, but we had a lot of belly pigs in the cities running around, no control, and they have taken care of that. Now we still have uh, transitional feral pigs in the country, which becomes a very high risk uh, situation, but uh, Wildlife Services is doing everything they can and they are getting tired also. It's been more than five years, so uh, we, can't, we can't drop our, our efforts right now, they need all the resources and funding that they can, or we're gonna give up. Remember, we leave these pigs without any control. In a year, they'll be back to where they were before. So it's gotta be constantly. So this is all the enhanced surveillance between wildlife services and us. You can see their activities are with the black spots, ours as with the green. We are constantly sending samples to the Dorado lab. If we did not have the Dorado lab, it would be going to NVSL and it would be very difficult for them to keep up with the amount of, of sampling we have to do. Um, and I'm almost done. Um, what are we gonna do projects? Um, I know I've been, I've been with this constant uh, asking for oral fluids. Why? Because our producers are getting a little bit uh, tired of, of our sampling. Now, uh, finally, we do have the ear swab technique, which is a less, lot less invasive, it's working very well. But if we can uh, add oral fluid, we can add more farms with less personnel. And I think our success and efficiency rate would still be very high, but that's my, uh, my opinion. So um, we need to continue to, to fund the terms that we have. Uh, most of them will be done in two years, which is the end of this year. So how long will the protection zone last? To me, as long as the DR is infected, as long as they're still having cases, Puerto Rico protection zone will be there. So we need to continue that says this is, has to occur. We drop our, our terms, we drop everything. We need to develop training opportunities with D1 and we already started that. D1 is very active and it's very concerned because they know they are a part of the ASF CSF entry into the US mainland and Florida knows it. So um, we have to continue working with them um, and expanding the response capacity um, in an event. What are we gonna do if we do get it? Do we have the resources to respond? Um, so these are the entries, the illegal boat landings, the ferry, which is a, a very, very efficient way to bring products from the DR to Santo Domingo to San Juan, even though it's inspected and everything has to be done, you know that inspection does not guarantee 100%. So you're, you're bringing products. Do we get them or not? Um, that's the challenge. Yeah, super a lot of international flights, which I think PPQ does a great job, but every time there's international flights, the risk is still there. And then something that nobody has talked about is the private vessels that go fishing and go uh, to do vacation in, in Punta Cana from Puerto Rico. They're not inspected. They're not inspected. You can call in, you can do a, a call in custom check. You do the report and nobody goes to your vessel. So the only uh, um, private vessel that, I mean, marina that has a international garbage is in the Eastern part of the island, which attends all the uh, Virgin Islands area. So this is a very huge gap right there. Um, and so the multi-agency response exercise is gonna happen in May with the Department of Agriculture. We're working on a plan that needs to be done because the Puerto Rico uh, Department of Agriculture does not have a plan how to do uh, 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 ASF response. They do depend on VS to run it, 
but we need that plan because um, as you know, the state is in charge of the event until they do request, if they do, a transfer command with the SPR or work with a unified command structure. This is a very important exercise. Uh, Barbara Porter is helping us to uh, do it. It has been a challenge because if it was for just VSPR, we would have done it three years ago. But it, it, we need to depend on the local. And uh, as you know, it's, it's a challenge. Okay, um, so the scenario before we finish, what happens if we get uh, ASF in Puerto Rico 73 hours post? Uh, decision to depopulate versus a regional approach. Uh, we have about 100,000 pigs in the island. Is it small enough or big enough to warrant a regional approach or a depopulation effort? That will be uh, something to be discussed of. Uh, this will have to happen, stop all garbage feeding activities until we get it under control. Because as you know, that is one of the highest risk activities. We need to protect Virgin Islands. So um, Virgin Islands need to and have to ramp up their activities to make sure they don't get it. And then the states, D1 has to make sure all the pathways and everything has to be ready because the movement of Hispanic communities in the Eastern side are it's immense. There's more Dominicans and Puerto Ricans living in the Eastern coast than in the Puerto Rico alone. Biosecurity is going to be our problem always. Um, we're gonna have to increase it somehow. Uh, additional resources will have to be here for feral swine control. Even though they're doing a great, they're going to be pushed to a higher level. So wireless services is gonna be, need more funding. And then we were going to have to decide national INT to continue managing because my staff will probably run out of gas in a few weeks. So this is what we have to think about. Need to make sure that everybody uh, knows that Dr. Noelia Moyeno, Emer staff has collaborated in all the data and I hope she continues to do that. We could not work without her. So thank you, Noelia. And that's all I have. I'm sorry to have gone so fast, but I know you guys have a lot of, to do. Uh, Liz, back to you. Thanks, Fred, and thanks, Sylvia. We do have some questions. Let's see if we can get through some of them. Um, let's see. Are they moving individual semen product, or is it that they are they moving untested boars intended for breeding? I think that goes to Sylvia. Uh, well, they, uh, well, the semen that is imported uh, here in the DR is, uh, is free of ASF. It's just uh, uh, what is going on in the DR that uh, they are not testing it or they are just moving the animals back and forth. Are new infections still happening or has it been contained slash eliminated? Oh, I, sorry, I cannot hear you. Yeah. Are new infections still happening? In the deep. Has, yeah. Are new infections still happening or has it been contained or eliminated? Well, the new infections uh, happen and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the disease is uh, has a pattern of endemicity in the DR. Uh, we we get, uh, I would say, uh, between a four and, and a 10 outbreaks uh, per week. So yes, new infections are happening and the disease is uh, a, not a, a control here in the DR. We see, uh, some clusters in some areas, um, you know, uh, is yeah, the disease is here. It's, it's uh, and it's not really a full response uh, to ASF. So, so they keep spreading the disease through different means. The next question is: Any indications of impacts of disease on Haiti? Uh, 
Well, we uh, there, there is a, a different group. Uh, we've seen AFIS that is dealing with uh, Haiti. I can just tell you from uh, our side of the island, uh, we see a lot of cases um, uh, in the border with Haiti. There is a slaughterhouse uh, in a city called uh, Dachabon where we collect uh, samples and uh, many of these samples are uh, positive. Uh, so uh, yeah, the diseases they are, uh, I, I don't really know uh, much information. Uh, we are planning to have a meeting with Haiti uh, in the next few months trying to, to uh, determine an area that will be uh, free of uh, pig production. Uh, they have done uh, something uh, similar for a uh, classical swine fever. Uh, so we expect that, you know, in the near future, so. So is the DR lab now conducting any testing for other Caribbean countries? Uh, not at this point. No, uh, they are conducting only a uh, testing for uh, the, the DR, yes. Um, how is the DR managing relationships with Haiti on border surveillance, since this has always been a challenging border moving forward with managing the disease long-term? Uh, well, you know, uh, interestingly enough, all the cases uh, that have been tested for classical swine fever have been negative, so they don't have a, a classical swine fever. We have tested a lot of samples that uh, were negative to ASF, uh, were negative to CSF. So uh, we have had uh, meetings with Haiti in the past, uh, I would say a year and a half ago, uh, trying to to determine uh, how they is they are going to um, be treating this uh, border area. Um, not, not much has been done. Uh, we know there is a illegal movement of uh, animals and and uh, the sequencing of those animals that we see in the border are not really much different than uh, the ones uh, that we see in other parts of the country. Okay, do we have any information on how ASF was introduced into the DR in 2021? Uh, well, you know, uh, following the characteristics of the genotype um, and what they have found uh, is likely that has been uh, um, introduced from uh, from uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and we don't really know. I mean, there are like different theories. One is come, uh, that came from Eastern Europe or the other one is that it came from Haiti and it arrived in Haiti through a humanitarian aid uh, to Haiti and, and then spread. But uh, based on the uh, genetic uh, sequencing done by NBSL, my understanding is that has been one introduction of the disease in the island. How feasible is it to stop garbage feeding given the volume of food provided by this? Uh, and this is garbage feeding in the DR, right? I believe, uh, yes. So, so uh, you, you know, you have to consider that there are a lot of hotels in uh, Punta Cana, and um, there is uh, there is an industry there. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, figure it out how we can implement some uh, mitigations in this type of garbage. Uh, um, you, you know, just to clarify, it is prohibited the garbage feeding uh, a, a, in swine for swine here in the DR, but it occurs. So, so uh, uh, due to the fact that the garbage feeding will continue occurring, we are trying to figure it out a way to mitigate it. Uh, so, continue uh, maybe uh, helping them to change the regulation and allow it. Uh, um, you know, the same way that is that in Puerto Rico, uh, mitigating uh, uh, the disease.
garbage cooking or something like that. And we have some, um, we have some uh, capacity building that we are going to have in the eastern part of the island. You know, you have to consider also that there are 10 million people coming to the Dominican Republic per year. They reach the 10 million people. So there are a lot of people uh, coming and going and these hotels have a, a lot of garbage. So uh, we are going to be visiting the hotels and try to understand better the production system and try to contribute in a way to mitigate this. So the question, I guess, was for the uh, Puerto Rico, the 73 hour plan was to stop garbage feeding immediately, but that's an immediate large scale need for feed that will no longer be accessible. Yep, uh, I agree. Yeah. In a perfect world, depending on where the index case would be in Puerto Rico, we may be able to split the island in quarters or half and part of the island would still be able to use garbage feeding, but that's only in a perfect world. Um, we also need to know what is USDA decision is if we're going to just work on a regional uh, depopulation or are we going to work uh, the whole island just to make sure we can get this done. But you're right, I mean, and also the, the Department of Ag will have a lot of issues because the school lunch program uses the swine uh, industry to get rid of all this excess waste. So that's a great question. I don't have the answer, but that's the rule we have to try to implement. Great, do we have any other questions? I know we went over, but it was certainly a great discussion. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Well, I will tell you this, we maxed out our lines at 350 and a lot of people were still trying to get on. So um, the uh, importance of this webinar, I think is shown by the number of people that did get on and the questions that were being asked. Um, so thanks everyone. Um, if for anybody that you know that uh, is wondering if it's being recorded, it has been recorded. It will be put on the TEP website video gallery, which the link is at the bottom of the invite, and that will probably take about a week to get that uploaded. But I cannot thank you enough, Sylvia and Fred. Presentations were great. Information was great. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.